Oh, you're gonna love today's text. Y'all ready? Oh, this is a good one. This is, my, I, this is the scariest text in the entire Bible to me, so we're gonna have fun with it. I don't know how you have fun with a text like this, but we're gonna try. Matthew 7, you ready? Matthew 7, 21 through 23. I want you to feel this text. This is Jesus speaking. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then will I declare, I, Jesus, will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Told you it was a good one. Um, I, I've got to be honest and a little bit transparent with you this, this morning. Last night, um, the family, we were out yesterday, and um, I'm freaking out. It's like most of the times on Saturdays, I come up here, and I get ready. The sermon's already written. We're good to go. This is just like put the final touches on it. Practice it. Make sure you know what you're talking about so you don't make a complete fool of yourself. And yesterday while we were out, I'm like, tomorrow's sermon's terrible. It's like horrible. And so I came in. We got home from dinner, and it's Melanie's birthday weekend, which she could care less about, but we care. We care because we like her. And so I, while we're out, I'm just like, I can't preach this to them. This is bad. It, it's probably not bad. It wasn't good. And so I came in here last night and totally rewrote it. Um, and so we're going a different direction than we were originally thought. And this text has been on my heart um, all week long. And I'm like, we, we've got to cover this. We've got to talk about this. Because here's what we're doing in this series right now that we're talking about Church Matters. What, what we're doing in 2024 is we're doing a, a number of series around ecclesiology, which is the understanding, the study of the church. What, what did Christ intend for his church? Why is the church the church? What is the church supposed to do? What is supposed to matter to the church? And so we're talking about all these different issues. So we started the year with a, a quick sermon. It was kind of the preface, the prelude to all of the meat that we're gonna cover about service order. Does it matter what we do on Sunday mornings? And we came to the conclusion that biblically, yes, it matters what and how we do what we do on Sunday mornings. And then the last two weeks, we've spent unpacking what the gospel is. This word that we as Christians, especially evangelical Christians, we throw this word out there all the time, but I don't think we actually understand what it means. So is it, what, what does it mean, this message of good news of Jesus Christ? Is it just love God, love neighbor? Is it Jesus just smiling on us? Is it doing some good stuff? What, what's the gospel? So we spent two weeks, instead of one, we spent two weeks unpacking what the gospel is. And, it, and as much as I don't ever want to make scripture out to be a formula, the gospel is kind of a formula. There are four parts to the gospel. And these four parts are really important. We can't add to these four parts, and we shouldn't subtract any of them from the gospel. If we do, it's not the full gospel. And unfortunately for us sometimes, and this is when we drift away from things, unfortunately for us, we've kind of lost track of what the gospel actually is. So we're recalibrating. We're bringing this back to center. This is what the gospel really is. Four parts. It's God, man, Christ, response. Four parts. God, man, Christ, response. The most important of those four elements, those four parts of the gospel, is God. The very first one, everything is about him. So if you don't remember anything else, remember, everything stems and flows from God Almighty. He is both creator and he is holy. So he's created all things. This is why at the end of our services, every week since we started this church, we do a benediction out of Romans eleven thirty six, 36, which says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. He alone is creator. So he has created everything. And not only that, but he's also holy. And in order to understand the gospel, we need to understand first and foremost that God is holy, meaning he's complete. There's no sin. There's no unrighteousness. There's no lack. There's no want. He is total and complete. Now, the reason this is important is because when man steps into the scene, when the second part of the gospel steps in, it's compared and contrasted to God's holiness. How do we do when we put ourselves up or stack ourselves up against God's holiness? Now, we don't do very well, do we? Right, so think about this. God is creator. At the beginning in Genesis, he creates all that is. He spends six days creating the heavens and the earth and animals, yes, even cats. I gave the cat people some love. So all of these animals are created, and then he creates man, and he creates man specifically in his likeness, in his image. We alone were created in the Imago Dei. We represented him. We were created as the apple of his eye. We were sinless. We were holy. 
And ladies and gentlemen, remember, as you read Genesis, 66 books of the Bible, in the very first book, only two pages into the book, we blow it. It took us zero time to go from holy to unholy, where we fall for Satan's trap. And then here's what we talked about that week, if you remember, where we talked about man, Jesus, in response. What we talked about is I think we as Christians often take the, or even culture in general, we take the understanding of sin way too lightly. We're like, it's an oopsie right? It's Britney Spears. Oops, I did it again. It's like, ah, it's just a minor traffic violation. No big deal. But when your God who created you in his image is absolutely righteous and absolutely just and absolutely holy, and you come at him with your sin, and by the way, you're not just sinning. You're trying to dethrone him and steal his glory and sit on the throne of all the universe. This is where all of a sudden we have a problem, So if the gospel doesn't have man's depravity, where Ephesians 2 says we're dead in our trespasses and sin, then we don't understand the gospel because there's nothing to be rescued from if we are just good people. But the Bible shows us that we are dead in our trespasses and sin because of what Adam and Eve did and also because we sin every single day. So God is holy. We are unrighteous. What does God do about that? Remember last week, you remember the three responses that God could have given and we played that game where it says, hey, let's play God for a minute. Like, don't take it too seriously, but let's step into God's shoes. If you were God and the people you created in your very image to glorify you the most, like these are your people. This is your primary source of glory in all of creation. And that very creation decided, eh, it's not good enough for me. I'm gonna steal your glory. What would you do? What would you do? You can ignore them right? Pretend that they didn't sin. Pretend that they don't exist, kind of like you do with the check engine light or the oil change light on your light, and hope it just goes away. I hope it's going to take care of itself, but it won't, right? Because sin is there, and it's prevalent, and it's put a dark mark on the glory of God canvas. So God could ignore us, or he could do what I would do, which is press the big red smite button in the sky and wipe us out, man. I would, I would lose my cool. I'm like, you're going to betray me? You're going to be the traitor race? Cool, cool, cool. You gone. We're done, like we're we're broken and it's over. I'm gonna wipe you off the face of this canvas. He doesn't do that either. So he doesn't ignore us. He doesn't smite us. He does the unthinkable. He redeems us. And, And redemption came at a cost. You remember this? This is the third part of the gospel. God is holy, man is depraved, enter Jesus. The son of God, the righteous, holy son of God puts on human skin, comes on Christmas morning or whatever time of Christmas it was, the first Christmas day, he becomes one of us, lives a sinless life in the skin of man for 33 years, ministers, teaches, suffers temptation, and all the things that we suffer, but without sin, and at the end of it, pays the price that you and I can't pay. You see, we needed a fix. We needed salvation. We needed a redeemer because we were dead in our trespasses and sin. Our relationship with God, holy God, was broken and couldn't be restored by us because dead people can't do anything. We can't fix ourselves. We can't go to therapy. We can't take a pill. We're dead. So somebody needed to intervene on our behalf, and that was Jesus. The Son of God comes and dies on a cross for our sins, pays the price and the penalty for us, becomes the propitiation, the mediator of God's wrath for us, and becomes our Savior that we can do for ourselves, couldn't save ourselves. And then finally, the final part of the gospel. So it's God, man, Christ. Now the ball's in our court. What do we do? How do we respond to that? How do we respond to the grace of God? When we understand the true gospel, how should we respond? When we understand God is holy, we're wickedly depraved apart from Christ. We didn't deserve one drop of grace, but for whatever reason, out of love, God gives his son for us. How do we respond? And the biblical response to that is that we respond in faith. And I wanna talk today about that response, the fourth part of the gospel. That's where I want to land. Now, to do that, let me introduce you to the week that was. Anybody have a week? Like, you're looking back, you're like, I needed church today because my week was insane. Anybody? Yeah? Ray's shaking his head. He was in Dallas. Anytime you're in Texas, that's insane. Anybody else just have a week? A week? Okay. We've had a week. Um, This week started with, last week we did the benediction, and as soon as it was done, I run to the elementary classroom to make sure that Pastor Laura, our children's pastor, hasn't burst. Okay, that girl was so pregnant, like so pregnant. And this baby was not coming out. Like Nolan liked his, his living room, his living space with, with his mama. So on Monday morning, they induced, um, Laura was induced at 8 a.m. The baby was intended to be born on 
January 22nd, okay, so Monday, at some point, baby did not want to come out. Baby finally came out on Tuesday sometime after 1 a.m. He was born on 123, 123, um, and we were introduced to Nolan David Lubeck, and I want to introduce him, him to you this morning if, so you can see a picture of him. So that is the little guy. Stop, I, I, stop staring at the T-shirt. Yes, we're national champions. We know, okay? <laughs> Settle down. My bad. But that is Nolan, and this is photos of their family. That's Lily and Sonny getting to meet him. Um, Lily loves her little brother. Um, Sonny, he's not so fond of him yet, but he's, get, he's getting there. Um, and, and Nolan is beautiful. He was totally healthy. Birth went perfect. Everything went perfect. So thank you for praying. We visited them last night, and, and they're doing great. Nolan looks like his big sister. He's got Lily Mae's face, um, and it's amazing. So saying that, Let me bring you to the week that was. I haven't been a youth pastor in a long time, and there's reason for that. You age out. Most people, Zach will never age out. Zach's gonna be... Zach's going to be 70, and he will still be that kid, right? If you know Zach, you know that's true, right? So he will, he, it's just true about Zach. But I aged out. I aged out about 28 years old. I became an old man at about 28. Um, but this week, I got to put youth pastor hat back on because somebody needed to step into the role, and I'm so grateful. Listen, church, we've got, and we don't acknowledge this enough, um, all of you guys that lead or serve in our ministries, whether it's our kids' ministry or our youth ministry, young adult ministry, God bless you. Just God bless you. I love you guys so much. This week I got a a new understanding of what our youth leaders um, do every single week. Our kids, our youth ministry is awesome. I love our kids so much. They smell. Boy, do they smell. Um, On Wednesday nights after they've been to school all day, woo, uh, you're ripe. You are ripe. And and so on, on Wednesday night, I love you. I love you, though. I smelled once upon a time, too. I might as well. But um, on Wednesday night um, with the youth leaders, um, came in here and we, we did the service with the kids. It was really cool and got to preach on God's glory um, to them. And then two nights later, I, I still think Zach and Laura did this on purpose. Two nights later, it was Rock the Universe and Zach was not allowed right, rightly. He was trying to go and we're all like, no, you, dude, your baby's four days old. You're staying home with your wife and your three kids. So he wanted to go, and, and so we went to Rock the Universe, got home about 1.30. That, that's an ungodly time. It's just, and Universal Studios is so loud. Is so, there are so many teenagers. Um, and our kids, right, our kids got tired. Sophia, you were exhausted. By 11 p.m., they're getting, they're not grumpy, but they're done. And so we, we left about midnight, got home. Um, and it was really interesting. So I got to hang out with the kids, and these are some special kids. I've been a part of a lot of youth groups over the years, but these kids, just the way they love each other and um, they love Jesus. It was just it, what, what Zach and Laura have cultivated, the culture they have cultivated at this youth group is, is sensational. It's fantastic. Now, Wednesday night, um, the, the leaders, you guys did everything. You led worship, you did the games, you set up, tear down. I just, had, I just got to preach. And so I came in here, and I'm like, what am I gonna talk to them about? And I'm like, okay, if I only get one opportunity to share something with them, I'm gonna share with them my heart's message, which is about the glory of God and how the gospel plays into that, that they have purpose in life, that all of us, according to Colossians, we all have the same purpose. So whether you're a nurse, an architect, a stay-at-home mom, a pastor, whatever it is, a student, whatever it is, whatever it is you do with your life, don't put so much pressure into what you're gonna do because at the end of the day, all that matters is that whatever you do, in word or deed, you do it for God's glory. So don't stress out about the title. Just go, hey, in these decisions that I'm making, in my relationships, in my finances, in my career, in my school, am I bringing glory to God with these decisions? And that, that, that's what I taught them. Now, here's why I did this. And this leads into um, this morning, what, what we're trying to talk about. You're like, what does this have to do with depart from me? I never knew you. Like, get to the point. Here, here, here's where we're going. You guys probably know the stats. And as Christian parents, these are the stats that terrify us. Most people... Most people, if they're going to become Christians, will become Christians before they are 18 years old, okay? So the National Association of Evangelicals says that by 14 years old, 65% of all people who are eventually going to become Christians become a Christian, like a full commitment to Jesus Christ before they're 14. Other studies say all the way up to 18, it's 85% of all people who become Christians make that choice and that decision before they are 18 years old. So if you came to Christ after you were 18 years old, you're one of the 15%. It's really hard to reach somebody once they're post-high school age group. So I'm talking to these kids knowing, and listen, 
these kids in the youth group, even while we're at Universal, in, in my head, I'm praying for these kids. Because I'm like, you're in a world that I'm not used to. You're living in, in, in school and education systems and cultures that are so distant from what I grew up with. So praying with them and understanding that in a few months or in a few years for some of them, all of a sudden that 18-year-old ticking time bomb is going to go off and all of a sudden they're gonna be independent. Some of them are gonna go off to school. Some of them are gonna go into their career field. Some of them are just gonna move out of home, move out of the home and they're gonna be in their apartments or whatever. But all of a sudden when you hit that 18, 19-year-old range, all of a sudden you've got independence. And this is where, typically, the Christian kid, the kid who was raised in church, the kid who went to the youth camps and raised his or her hand, the one who came down on the altar calls, the one who committed their lives to Christ and served with the babies and did all of these different things, at 18, 19, 20, when they experience independence, the statistics show us they start drifting. And for us parents, am I right? For us as parents, this is like our number one prayer. Like we pray for their, their physical safety, but their spiritual safety is, is like God hang on, hang on to them, let them hang on to you. And, and, and so we see that this, this could be an issue where they begin drifting. Now, now, here's what I'm concerned with, because these kids will go away, they'll be independent, and all of a sudden they don't have mom and dad breathing down their neck, you gotta go to church with us today, you gotta go to youth group on Wednesday. Mom, I, I don't like church, I know, but you're going. Well, all of a sudden mom and dad aren't there to make you go. And so you're in a new city, you're in a new town, you don't know anybody, you don't know a church, You've got, if you're going to go to church, you're going to a place where you don't know anybody, right? So all of a sudden, it's really hard to live out the faith that you were living when you were under mom and dad's roof, so you start drifting, and you don't even notice it. It's like last week, what we talked about, just like a slight drift, and then all of a sudden, years later, you're like, how did I get here? How did I get here? And my question as a pastor, and even as a parent and a Christian is, what in the world can we do, or what has happened where we can have our kids go away or it's not just kids, it's, it's anybody can drift. But what happens where this drift can take place and we can just casually walk away from the Lord? And what happened back there at youth camp? What happened back there at the altar call? What happened in that ministry time? Was it real? What does God have to say about that? And so, and so what do we do with that? And here, here's what I think the problem is. This is me. I think the problem is as a parent, as a brother, as a son, as a pastor, I think sometimes what we have done is we have not given kids and the church in general the truth of the gospel and we've watered down the gospel to appease people and we have had a false understanding of the doctrine of conversion. What does it mean to actually be converted to Jesus Christ? And so today I wanna talk about that, okay? As uncomfortable as that is, this text just leads the way. I think the primary problem is that we have not preached the true gospel and our churches and people have had an improper doctrine of conversion. Now let's talk about that. What, what does this have to do with anything? I think all of us that claim Christ, we all say, hey, I'm a Christian. We mark, we'll check that box. I'm a Christian. I think all of us would agree, we want people to come to Christ, right? So not all of us are natural evangelists like Gary or Alan or some of you, Chris Griffith, some of you people in this room that you like have no problem just going out and sharing the gospel to perfect strangers. But I think all of us who love Jesus are like, we want as many people to come into this church, find Christ, love Christ, worship Christ as possible. We want that. We want them to ultimately enter eternal life in heaven through Jesus. But my question is, do we want it so badly for people that we feel that it's our job to cheapen and soften the gospel to make it more palatable for them? Has the church done this question? Has the church done this in the past 20, 30 years? Has the church as a whole not necessarily Orlando North, but maybe we're part of that, as the church as a whole softened and weakened, sold a gospel that isn't full and complete so that we can get more people in the pews, so that we can have higher numbers, so we can feel better about ourselves and, and make people believe that they are saved and that everything is okay. Do we make it easy? And do we present a gospel that's not costly at all, that this thing won't cost you anything? For those of you guys that didn't grow up in an evangelical church, let me kind of present to you. And I'm not bashing. For everybody who's getting nervous, like, hey, he's, he's bashing. No, I'm not bashing your thing, okay? I just want to present the normal tendencies of the evangelical church of bringing somebody to Christ and show that maybe we have got it a little bit incomplete. It's a little insufficient. And, and here's what I mean. We can have a, a youth rally. We can have youth camps. How many of you guys got saved either in children's ministry or youth ministry? Right, you came to Jesus, I did too, okay? So children's ministry is where I gave my life to Christ. 
And so at some point in our lives, we sat under somebody that was teaching the gospel. Somebody shared the gospel, enough for us to understand at least pieces of it, that Jesus loves me, I'm a sinner, right? I, I need to turn my life over to him. So at some point, whether it's a youth camp, a children's kids crusade, maybe a Sunday morning service or a Sunday evening service, the, the gospel was presented and then a response was invited. Like, hey, do you want to respond to this? And so how do we respond? We respond by either raising our hands or coming down to the altar, which to this day, to this day, I never understand why we call it an altar call, okay? I get it, but altar ministry is an Old Testament thing where the lamb or the goat was sacrificed for the sins of the people. When I come forward, I am not dying for my sins. Somebody has already died on the altar for my sins. I'm attaching myself to the crucifixion of Jesus, okay? So anyways, we come forward to this thing we call an altar call, and then the pastor, the guest speaker, whoever's doing it leads them in a prayer. What do we call that prayer? Sinner's prayer, okay? And it's, it's kind of this prayer of, of God, I'm a sinner, and this is, this is absolutely gospel-centered, okay? There's nowhere in the Bible that this prayer is lined out, but it's, it's implied, okay? So we come to Christ, we confess that we are sinners, we confess that we need him, we confess that, we confess the gospel, God, man, Jesus response, right? God, you're holy and you're perfect, and I'm screwed up apart from you, but Jesus, you gave your life, so today I receive you by faith, not by works, I receive you. And we make that decision, we make that declaration, and all of a sudden we get that membership card into heaven, right? Or, or maybe we get the get out of hell free card, and we, we carry that card with us, and that is now ours. That's our new identity. We're now a Christian, and we're sealed in the Holy Spirit. Th this is what takes place at this. And in that moment, we declare, we declare, Jesus, I am surrendering to you as both Savior and Lord. Now, here's the thing, and I think this is where we as evangelicals have screwed it up. We have convinced people that Jesus is Savior, but we do a really poor job of recognizing him as Lord. We can point back to the day of our salvation where we gave our lives to Jesus as Savior, but have we been following him as Lord all the years following that? So we're, we make Jesus our Savior, but when we cheapen the cost of following him, we refuse to make him Lord, and we'll talk about this in a moment. And my concern is that because of this, so many people who have sat under the preaching of charismatic, energetic, engaging preaching, not even unbiblical preaching, are going to experience the nightmare that is Matthew chapter seven. And this terrifies me. Can I, can I read this text to you one more time? Listen to these words. Matthew seven, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, this text, I've told you guys this before. Um, the reason this text terrorizes me, there's several reasons. On a personal level, it's just like, okay, I wanna know that I'm saved. I wanna know that God and I are good, and we'll read a text out of 1 John chapter 3 in a minute that this is our assurance of salvation. But I was introduced to this text at an early age, and it wasn't through a Bible reading. It's not like we were sitting down one day and we read this text. Instead, it was a Sunday night service, and if you guys grew up in smaller churches, you would have um, a special, during the offering, normally during the offering, the offering's taken, and somebody would sing a special song to a track, right? So it was like those green and purple tracks, plug it in, and somebody would sing a song. It was like on repeat, same four songs. Every, every fourth Sunday, you'd get a repeat of that song. Well, one of those songs was sung by my great-grandmother. Um, her, her name's Hazel Clark. And um, she, like, when I was born, she was old. And so she was still, like, I, my kids got to meet her. So they, she was alive for a long time. And, and she sang the song to this scripture. There, this scripture is actually put to song. And it's called, Sorry I Never Knew You. And it's just, sorry I never knew you. I mean, it's the most depressing, horrible song. That, and then imagine a 95-year-old grandma singing it, okay? It's, oh, it's haunting. It, it's terrifying. And in that moment, my soul was gripped by this text. So part of me is looking at it from a personal level, but then there's the other side of me as pastor, father, brother, son, where it's like, hey, is there anybody who has sat under my teaching over the years that someday they're going to stand before the Lord, they're going to stand before Jesus, and we talked about this in Revelation, Jesus is going to say, why should I let you into my heaven? And, and they come up with all these things that they thought I taught them or that I did teach them. In my terror, my nightmare, 
is that in that moment, Jesus is going to say to somebody that sat under my teaching, sorry, you worker of lawlessness. I don't know you. Depart from me. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. What? And the reason that grips my soul is because I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me. And so my job is to make sure we understand the full gospel. So when you stand before God, when you stand before God, he knows you. And you know him. And this won't be your story out of Matthew chapter 7. So this is why we're doing this today. Now, think about this in the church. I wonder how many of us have been part of a church where instead of handing out get out of hell free cards where grace is cheap and grace is easy, we actually called people to submit to the lordship of Jesus, not just the savior part of it. Think about what we've done. Like, I, I think the hearts of the church for the last 20, 30 years has been, I think it comes from a good space. I do. I think it comes from a good spot. We all want people to come to Christ. We want as many people to come to church. I mean, we want to we want to build help Christ build the church, right? This is his church. We want as many people to go to heaven as possible. And I think the temptation in that is that we need to help God out, Godding. Not not with our part, not doing our part. I think sometimes we're like, God, you need help on your part. So you have given us the gospel, and I'm supposed to teach this gospel of God, man, Jesus response. And I think it's my job to soften the blow, to make it not as confrontational. Where all of a sudden it's like, hey, you know what? You can be a Christian, you can follow Jesus, but still be the same person as you were before the prayer, before the big day, before you committed your life to him. And so we kind of blend the two. We say there's really not much difference between being a Christian, not being a Christian. You just said a prayer. And as long as you said the prayer, as long as you came forward and did the thing, you've got the Costco card, man. You've got the get out of hell free card. You're good. And so we kind of blend it because we want more people. And what we're kind of doing is, you think through the parables, and we'll talk about parables later this year, is we're building our house on sand when we do that. When we don't expose the full gospel of Jesus and we have people commit to following Jesus, but it's not the full gospel. All of a sudden, we're building our house upon sand instead of rocks. So when the storms and the waves of life come, that house falls flat. That's what's happening here in Matthew chapter 7. So do we want to be a church that does that or do we want to be Different. It's interesting because when we think about Jesus' calling for us to follow him, how often does Jesus say, you know what? Just say the prayer, man, and we're good. It's not gonna cost you anything. Like, come follow me, man, but it's, it's gonna be, you're gonna live the high life. It's all gonna be good. Matter of fact, you don't even really need to follow, follow me. Just say that you do, and we're good. But then we're introduced to scriptures like this. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. This is Paul speaking. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live through faith by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I have been crucified with Christ. Does that sound pleasant? Anybody going, oh, that's some good news. I, like, hey, Jesus, I want to be crucified with you. That sounds pleasant. That's, that, no, that's giving up your life. That's dying to yourself daily, Right? Over and over again. Then in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says this, I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus the Lord. I die to myself every single day. And then over and over again, we see it in the Sermon on the Mount. We see it in Jesus' own life. As people come to him and say, I want to follow you. And Jesus is like, okay, but I want to make sure you understand what it means to follow me. Remember the rich young ruler? And Jesus is like, hey, rich young ruler, hey, you can follow me, but before you do, go sell everything you have. Give it away to the poor, then you can come follow me. Because the identity of this guy was wrapped up in his wealth. And so he's like, give up that identity, surrender all, then you can follow me. He didn't say, just say the prayer, and then we're good. It's like, you got to surrender all. Matthew 8, Jesus is talking to more people that want to follow him. He says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. It's like, it's not easy following me. It's not just, hey, just say this prayer and everything's good. I'm asking you, when you follow me, you give up and you surrender to me as Savior. Yes, I redeem you and I cleanse you of all sin. And yes, you will still not be perfect. You will be an imperfect human who messes up all the time. But I'm calling you to my lordship where I am in charge of your life. And this is what we encounter in Matthew chapter 7. So when we get to this stage in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is teaching us that he is the gatekeeper of heaven. All of our jokes, right? All of our jokes about heaven have St. Peter 
At the, you know, he's got the Lamb's Book of Life, and he's looking for your name. But this shows Jesus is like, I'm at the door. I'm the one keeping the gate. And people are going to come to me and say, Lord, Lord, and have all of these different things. He alone is the ultimate judge. So many are going to explain to him their works to get into heaven, right? This is what I've done. This is how I'm doing. And can we confess something? Tell me the truth. When you read what these guys in Matthew 7 are saying, like, hey, I've prophesied in your name. I've cast out demons in your name. I've done all these mighty works in the name of Jesus. Can we confess? That's a pretty impressive list. Like, oh my gosh. Like, you're doing exorcisms in the name of Jesus? Okay, so demons are coming out of people as you declare the name of Jesus. You're prophesying. So prophecy here could mean a multitude of things. You're, you're prophesying and stating something that God is going to do in the future. Prophecy is often proclaiming the gospel. You're preaching the word, which for pastors, how many of you guys know that there's pastors that are gonna have a rude awakening when they stand before God on that day? That terrifies me, right? So we've done all of these good works. And the bottom line is they're coming to Jesus saying, hey, let me into heaven, why? Because I know you. And the reason they're not led into heaven is because Jesus says to them, okay, I question whether or not you really know me the way the gospel says you should. The problem is I don't know you. I don't know you. Now, God created us so he has, he understands who you are. He knows your address. He knows how many hairs are on your head, all that. But there's something about this word, no, K-N-O-W. Now, here, here it is. In Matthew chapter 1, he uses this word no, and it's the Greek word gnosko, and it, it's an interesting way to use it in chapter 1. In chapter 1, it's talking about sexual intimacy, okay? So it's knowing somebody in a way that nobody else knows this person, right? And so it's the way you would know your spouse, but then in Matthew 7, the way that he's using it, it's an Old Testament, Old Testament idiom for the way God knows his chosen people. His particular people, the people that belong to him. I know you. And so it's not just, hey, I know of Jesus. Hey, I said a prayer about Jesus. It's no, I, I know who Jesus is. I know that God is holy. I know that I have sinned. I know Jesus is my savior. There's an intimate relationship with him, an ongoing relationship with Jesus where I've surrendered myself to his lordship. This is knowing. And then on the opposite end, he's like, in that context, that is the will of my father. It's not that you've done all these deeds or that you've served in children's ministry. I appreciate that. Or, or that you played an instrument or sang a song or greeted a hand or helped somebody to their seat or led a connect group. At the end of the day, does Jesus know you in relationship? And this goes so contrary to the model of say the prayer and then you have, never have anything to worry about ever again. It's kind of like working out your salvation with fear and trembling, that you say yes to God here, but then the rest of your life is submitting to his lordship. Now, are there going to be setbacks? Are there going to be failures? Yes. Does Jesus run and scram in those moments? No. No. But the living out of our life is fruit and evidence of whether or not we meant what happened back here at that prayer. Does that make sense? And so in that moment, in that season, Jesus is saying, I know you and I know you now, and this is what salvation is. So this idea of I never knew you means he doesn't recognize you as part of his family. And here's what the church is, by the way, there's good news. If you're terrified, hold on, okay? Please hold on. Here's what the church has done in watering down the gospel. We want people to come to Jesus, so we've told them a half truth, the parts of the truth that are good, right? Jesus will get you salvation. You'll be freed from all your sins. You get eternal life with him. And is that good news? And is that true? Yeah, abs one, we wouldn't have gone through revelation if this wasn't true. This is our hope. But is it going to cost you nothing? No, it's going to cost you everything. To follow Jesus, you are laying down your life to say, I follow you. And so when we say yes to Jesus, and there's no difference before, between our before and after, we bought into a cheap gospel. We want our churches to grow. Hasn't that been the model of church growth over the last 20, 30 years? It's like, let's make it cool. Let, let's get people in. Let's not tell the whole gospel because we don't want to offend. Let's soften the blow. Let's convince the sinner that they're just like the rest of us, that there's no difference, and then just let them blend in together. 
We're trying to blur the lines between a Christian and a non-Christian, saying that you can become a Christian without sacrificing much. You can have your cake and eat it too. But guys, this is not the gospel. This isn't what the Bible says. This isn't what Jesus says. Think about this, and this is something, and if this isn't clear, it's because I wrote it at 10 o'clock last night, and I'm hoping the Holy Spirit will work through this. I want you to think about this. I've been chewing on this for for months now because at first when I heard it, it kind of, it didn't sit well with me. But Jesus, as we read through his teachings and his works in the New Testament, he had no problem, no problem drawing a line in the sand between those who are his and those that are not, making a clear distinction. There there was no, oh, maybe. It was, no, 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 You're, you're, you're either hot or cold, not lukewarm, Right? There's wheat and chaff, there's sheep and goats, there's known and unknown. And, and I think what we have done as the church is we're so afraid to offend the person who's not a Christian and say, no, 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 you're, you're kind of like us and you're just, you just, you know, we're, we're similar. You're not a goat, you're, you're not chaff, right? You're not unknown, you're, you're not cold, and so we've got this game that we're playing where we want to soften the blow, make it as easy as possible. But the problem is Jesus makes this distinction. There are those that are his and there are those that are not his. And those that are not his, their destiny is not good. And they need to know that right now they're not his. How are they ever going to become his if they don't know they're not his? And so Jesus is like, make that mark, make that distinction, let them see what they're missing. Isn't this what he did with the Jews in the, for, in the New Testament? All of a sudden, the gospel comes to the Gentiles, and he's using this relationship of Jesus and the Gentiles to attract the Jews, saying he's trying to make them jealous. See what you no longer have. See what you have gone against. I want you to see this and then come running to Christ. So Jesus is showing that there's a distinction so that those that are not his will become his. And so he's not afraid of offending He's not afraid of preaching the gospel because he cares about the truth more than he does offending people. Knowing he could be unoffensive or non-offensive, but at the end of the day, they're gonna stand before God in judgment, and in that day, Jesus would say, sorry, I didn't know you. Which is worse, to be offended by the gospel here on earth or to stand before a holy God and be turned away? So it's only when you know you are on the outside looking in that you can even realize what you're missing. And I think the church is often afraid of offending people because we want you to attend our thing, our churches, make our thing bigger. And so we intentionally blur the lines between sheep and goats, wheat and chaff, cold and warm, known and unknown. And Jesus is like, I went to the lost to see those who are mine and desire what they, I want those, I want those that are lost to see those who are mine and desire what they have. And if we pretend that they're not lost, they will never leave the desire to be rescued, or they'll never have the desire to be rescued. Let me conclude with this. Nathaniel, if you'll come on up, bud. First John 3, I want to read this to give us some hope. Uh, I'm so sorry. I had it. I'm doing sword drills right now live in front of you guys. First John chapter 3. This is what John says. And John has one of the strongest gospels. Now we get to his epistle in 1 John. And so if you're freaking out and you're like, hey, is this me? Am I gonna be turned away? He also gives us assurance. And this is why Brad read an assurance of pardon this morning. I want you to understand that what I'm saying on that day when you give your life to Jesus, that's a powerful moment. I'm not saying don't discredit that moment. That, that moment's absolutely essential. But I think what happens after that is the rest of our life proves whether or not we submitted it to him as both Savior and Lord. Or if we just wanted the Savior card and didn't really want to fully submit to him as Lord. And how many of us know people in our lives that we know said the prayer? They came to the altar, the camp, or the service, or we prayed with them but there's no fruit, there's no evidence of their life. These are the people that I'm praying for. And isn't it better for us as Christians to know and stop pretending that, hey, maybe they're okay? Wouldn't you rather know, hey, they're not okay and we need to get the gospel to them? We need to love them enough to share the truth with them. But for us that are children of God, listen to 1 John chapter three. John says this, see what kind of love the father has given to you, his child, that we should be called children of God. We belong to him, and so we are. John puts that in there. He's like, he's declaring it. He's stamping it. We're, it's privileged to be called children of God. This is who you are. 
The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. But your children, he knows you. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been prepared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. I was trying to think through this. Um, I kind of, you know, I think one of the things I was raised on um, in our church, and I never knew what to do with it, was it was like our church wanted to be Baptist, but charismatic Baptist, right? We wanted to be spirit-filled Baptist, whatever, whatever that means. And, but we were also anti-Baptist because like, when you think of Presbyterians, they're Calvinists, so they're about pre, predestination. That's what they're labeled as. And for those of us that weren't Baptist, we labeled all you Baptist people as once saved, always saved. Okay, you, you heard that? Like, say the prayer and you're good to go. And um, I, 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 was not, I, I, I was not raised with that kind of belief. I was raised with the kind of belief where I'm gonna lose my salvation every time I screw up. And so I got saved a lot when I was a kid. <laughs> I got saved a lot. Anybody spent a lot of time at the altar as a kid just running back and forth? Me, it was like a permanent place, a permanent posture for me and everybody in my youth group. It was every Sunday night, I'm gonna get saved again, over and over again. And looking back, I'm like, that's not what Jesus wanted either. Because there was no assurance of my salvation. All of my assurance was in me. What do I bring to the table? Like, what have I done wrong? What have I done right? If I've been a good boy this week, then maybe God and I are good. If I've done poorly, I'm like, I'm screwed. I'm hosed, right? No joke, and I think it's been a while since I've shared this with you, but um, probably until I was 12 years old, maybe 13, 14, um, at night I would have just horrible nightmares, and I would wake up thinking I'm going to hell. And because before I went to bed, I had like a revenge thought. I was a very competitive kid, okay? I know it's really hard to believe, but I was very competitive. So I would say something, I would act, I would treat my brother a certain way, I'd treat my parents a certain way. In the middle of the night, it wasn't even a nightmare, I'd just wake up and go, oh, I sinned before I went to bed. Dear Jesus, please come into my heart, please forgive me of all my sins. I wanna go to heaven, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, amen. And then, you know, the next thing I would do, I would run to my parents' bedroom to make sure they were still there. What if the rapture happened between the time I sinned and between the time I repented? And I, would, and I know it sounds funny, but this is true. I would first look at my dad, and if my dad was there, okay, cool, but that's not full assurance because it's my dad, right? <laughs> if mom's there, we're good, right? So all my peace, it's just true. My dad could have wrote that. It's just true. If mom's there, we're good. I'd go back to sleep and then rinse and repeat night after night after night. That's not the desire. That's not the desire of our king at all. So think of it this way. On June 22nd, 1996, I married Melanie. And and for all of you guys that, like maybe you're not married and you're looking forward to getting married someday, or you are married and you look back on this day, how, how much effort, time, money is put into that day, the wedding day, right? So much, so much money. Right, Gary? So much money. <laughs> it's so much resource, all of the, in, in that day. And that day is really, really important, right? Melanie and I have been married 27 years. That was one day out of 27 years. That day was important. But can you imagine on that day that I said my vows to Melanie, I promised her, I'll love her, I'll do all of these things. And then on day two, I'm like, but not really, but we said it. So we got the license and we're cool, Right? And a year later, yeah, really haven't worked on the marriage, haven't surrendered to each other, haven't sacrificed for each other, haven't loved each other well. We've just kind of gone, I mean, what kind of marriage is that? What kind of marriage is that? And 27 years later, it's just like, oh, but we got the card on June 22nd, 1996, so it's all cool because we said vows there. But the fruit, the, the evidence of our sincerity on that day is played out every day after that where we fight for each other even in those hard points, right? So everything happened, was committed on that day, but from that day forward, we fleshed it out. We lived it out. We fleshed out our salvation with fear and trembling. So listen, the the point of all of this, the point of all of this is the gospel isn't just say yes on that day. That's really important. That day matters. But let's not sell the gospel as just Jesus as savior. He's more than that. 
he is more, he, it's not just the wedding day where he saves you from your sin. He's also Lord for the rest of your life. We're day by day, we're surrendering to his lordship. God, what do you want from me today? I wanna be your obedient son. I wanna be your obedient daughter. And this is when we really know the Christ of the gospel. This is when we really know him and he knows us. And so there's assurance. We're, we're sealed in the Holy Spirit. We're, we're boxed in by Jesus and the Father and the Spirit. But the evidence of whether or not, and this is where, Baptist, I'll defend you here. I, I don't think you preach a once saved, always saved kind of thing. I, I think you preach that if you are saved, if you are genuinely really saved here, it will be evidenced by your faithfulness and your discipling along the way. And you will stay in Christ because of your authentic, it will be revealed. If you didn't really mean it and you walk away from the Lord, maybe you probably weren't saved at the beginning, right? That's how that kind of plays out. So today, for us, the body of Christ, I don't want you to walk away from here going, ah, am I saved or not? Listen, if you love Jesus and Jesus loves you, you're good. But can we preach a gospel that is deeper than just Jesus gives you a get out of hell free card? And let's preach a card or preach a Jesus, preach a gospel that says, listen, when we come to him, He's given his all and what he demanded. And this is why we just sang the song, Jesus paid it all. He gave everything. Now his demand on us isn't, hey, just give back some. Give me your life. Give me everything. That's what we signed up for when we follow Jesus. That's it. Father, I pray today through your word, I pray that you would illuminate the truth here, God. That you would encourage us that we are yours, that you've chosen us to be your sons and daughters. You have invited us into your family. And because of that, we're sealed by you. We're held by you. Our salvation is not dependent upon us. Our salvation is evidenced through us as we live in obedience to you and to your scriptures and to your spirit. I pray that God, every day when we're struggling, when we don't know what to do, that you would speak encouragement to our hearts, that you would speak direction and we would follow, that we'd become students of your word and we would love you deeply. God, I pray for anybody in here who maybe has signed up for a cheap gospel. That maybe they're just like, you know what? I just want the fire insurance. I just want to make sure I don't go to hell. God, I pray that you would work on their hearts today. That they would want to be in full surrender, full obedience to the lordship of Jesus. Letting you call the shots for their life. Letting you be in control of every single nook and cranny of their life. God, forgive us for watering down the gospel to make something of our, of, of our thing, of making it easy for people. God, I, I pray that we would understand what you've called us to, that you've called us to come and die, to give up our lives, our identity to you, knowing that the exchange is great. We're giving up our filthy rags for your righteousness. We're giving up our bondage for your freedom. So we rejoice in that, we celebrate that. We love you, Christ. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and let's sing together?